Great. So welcome everyone uh, to this week's uh, math physics seminar. Uh, so today we have uh, Chris Elliott from University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst, and he will uh, give a talk about framing anomalies in TQFDs. Uh, the floor is yours, Chris. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, so I'm very happy to get a chance to talk about this work. Um, we I'll talk about this a bit, but this is based on joint work with Owen Gwilliam and a larger sort of ongoing project with um, Owen and, and Brian Williams. And we have a, a paper on some of the things I'm going to talk about up on the archive as of last week. Um, so it's nice to get a chance to talk about it now that we've finished that stage. So maybe I'll start with a little summary of what I'm planning on um, talking about today. Um, so I want to start out by introducing a context, a sort of a mathematical language we're talking about TQFT, and a particular family of examples of topological field theories. Um, and these are field theories of what I'm going to call AKSC type. So I'm going to introduce you to what these examples um, look like and tell you some specific theories that fit into this framework. It's quite general and so includes quite a lot of examples that um, show up in um, applications. But I'll also introduce some of the mathematical language that I'm going to use for talking about field theory um, along the way. Then the main question that I want to address today is the question of when does it make sense to quantize a topological field theory on a general oriented manifold? So the kind of situation that I will typically be considering is I'll imagine a classical field theory that makes sense on curved spaces classically. And I'll suppose that I have constructed a quantization of that theory on Rn. Um, so I'm going to be asking the question about sort of, like we can think of it like this as completing the sort of filling in the square. We have sort of a classical field theory on Rn, um, and this, um, the definition of the classical theory will extend naturally to a more general curved n-manifold. I'm going to suppose that I can construct a quantum theory on Rn, and I want to ask when we can fill in this little square. Um, and so I'm going to discuss a theorem um, that describes, um, sort of allows us to answer this question. In general, there's an obstruction that prevents um, filling in the corner of this square, and I'll be able to give a very sort of concrete realization of what this obstruction looks like. Okay, and this will be specifically in the context of these this class of theories that I'll introduce these AKFC theories. And along the way, and at the end, I'll try and give some examples um, and some connections between this question and ideas in topology and homotopy theory and in representation theory. For example, there are examples that are related to the geometric language program that I'll mention. Okay. And as I said, this is based on joint work with Owen Gwilliam and Brian Williams. And I'll maybe talk along the way about some work in progress. So that's the plan. Um, as I was maybe saying at the beginning, people should feel free to ask questions as we go. I've got the chat open so I can see if somebody posts a question in the chat, um, but of course you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question verbally too. Right, so let me start then by talking about a formalism for discussing classical field theory. And this is going to go by the name of BV. The BV formalism, BV stands for Vitalin and Vilkovsky. Okay. So this is a language for discussing classical field theory that's particularly appealing to mathematicians. We're going to model classical field theories using um, ideas from homological algebra. Um, and I'll say a little bit, after, I'm going to first talk about classical field theory, but I'm going to say a little bit afterwards about how we might go about quantizing the sort of structure that I'm going to describe. So I'm going to give a, a general 
definition first. This is an algebraic characterization of the data of a field theory, including, including a, um, permitting for gauge theories or more exotic higher gauge transformations with sort of like um, higher, higher um, gauge theories that in natural language. language. So I think I'm going to do it by first giving a, a general abstract definition, and then I'll try and contextualize and interpret this definition, how to read it and how to think about it. And then we'll give some examples of um, instances of this definition. That's the plan. So I'm going to describe, I'm going to define something called the classical BV theory. So this is going to be a classical field theory um, on uh, smooth manifolds, which I call M. So the data that we're going to use, we're going to introduce. The first piece of data is a graded vector bundle on E, called E on M, sorry, whose sheaf of sections I'll denote MathCal E. And so one should think of this as encoding the fields of the theory. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what this grading means in a second. Together with some additional data that encodes the dynamics, that encodes the action functional. So the additional data that I'm going to require on this E, first I'm going to ask the E to be a DG Lie algebra. So I'm going to ask for the data of a differential from E to E of degree one and a bracket from it takes two copies of E, turns them to an E of degree zero. Okay, and these should be appropriately compatible. The bracket should be a derivation for the differential, um, and the bracket should satisfy the usual condition for being a DG, for being a, a Lie algebra, but including the data of the grading. So it should be graded anti-symmetric, and it should satisfy a graded Jacobi rule. Again, I'm going to talk about what the interpretation of this is, why, why this is going to have anything to do with field theory in just a minute. The other piece of data that I'm going to require is a symplectic structure. So I'm going to take a pairing, and we're going to be able to pair together two um, fields, two elements of E, and the output is going to be a density on M. Okay, so if M is oriented, this same as a, a top form. Um, and this pairing has degree minus three. So that, that's what is it be indicated by this shift, this shift by minus three on the right hand side. So for example, this pairing could pair together um, an element of degree one with an element of degree two to get the density, or an element of degree three and an element of degree zero. It should have overall degree minus three. So it pairs a, on the left hand side an element of degree three. Um, return to element of degree zero on the right. Sorry, what is DG Lie structure? What is DG? Ah, the DG, this is what I was talking about a second ago. DG means that I have this additional data of the differential. So I have not just the Lie bracket, but I also have a differential, a square zero differential um, of degree one. And this should be appropriately compatible with the bracket. So it should be a derivation, a der by derivation the differential. So it means I have a cochain complex and the Lie bracket, a cochain, cochain complex structure and a Lie structure, and those two structures should be appropriately compatible with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this pairing, this sometimes, this is sometimes called the, the BV bracket or the anti bracket. It's a symplectic structure of this of this odd degree, this degree minus three. So it's quite it, it it's quite natural to ask the question: What on earth does this have to do with field theory? Especially if you're used to thinking about field theory from the sort of physical point of view. This data is a way of encoding the action functional, um, the fields and the action functional of. Uh, classical field theory. Let me explain how to, do that, how to translate that. So the first piece of interpretation 
an ordinary sort of a physical field you should think of as a section of this bundle E of degree minus one, sorry, degree plus one. So the bundle E is a graded vector bundle and the ordinary fields are the sections that live in degree one. There are sections in other degrees that one could think of as other interpretations. For example, um, degree zero sections. The interpretation is that one should think of these as infinitesimal, encoding infinitesimal gauge transformations. Infinitesimal gauge symmetries. The way, in order to extract the action functional from this definition, the interpretation is that one uses the differential on E um, to define the quadratic term in an action functional. So this here is the, this is the, see, this is encoding the quadratic term. And the Lie brackets, this is, I guess, so this is being paired with alpha, is encoding a cubic term in an action functional. I'll, I'll mention, so one could extend this definition to allow for higher order interactions. In addition, the generalization one needs is to allow brackets, Lie brackets of degree greater than two. So one extends to what's called an L infinity algebra structure on E. So you're considering uh, differentials of degree one because you're considering a topological field theory, right? No, this is so far this this definition doesn't require any topological assumption. But uh, why um, aren't you considering quadratic differentials, for instance, because the, that would correspond to field, general field theories? Um, one could realize. So, for example, it makes total sense to realize um, Yang Mills theory from this point of view, the DG Lie algebra, let me just write out what the um, the cochain complex looks like. Uh, I'll, Yang Mills theory is encoded by a complex of this form. Okay. Um, so the differential here, so the differential, maybe maybe your question is the differential operator defining the DG Lee, the, the de defining the DG structure doesn't have to be a linear differential operator. In Yang Mills, one in the second order formalism, one allows part of the differential to be not a first but a second order differential operator. So the term one would have in the action functional would include something that looks like the integral of a wedge d star d a. This is the quadratic term in the Yang Mills action functional. So D here, I've, 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 I've used the letter D to indicate the differential on E, but it doesn't have to be a first order differential operator. It could be a higher order operator that's permitted. I don't know if that's is your question or if I misunderstood. Well, in, in general, you could always write it as a single D if, if you considered A, a wedge D F or something like that. Yeah, one could work in the, in this example, one could consider the second order formalism to reinterpret this as a first order differential operator as well. But the um, differential would, or the in, it, in that case, the vector bundle itself would depend on the choice of the metric. One would have, for example, self-dual two forms appearing as one of the terms in this complex. And the differential would involve the projection onto the self-dual path, and that would involve the choice of a metric. Yeah. Sorry, why n minus one? Why why is it such degree? Um, so this this is this is Yang Mills on R n. If one was in studying Yang Mills theory on R four on on a four manifold, then this would be a three, omega three. So the differential d star d takes a one form to an n minus one form in n dimensions. Thank you. Yeah. So a point that I did want to make here, though, um, these alphas don't have to be homogeneous elements of E. They can be inhomogeneous elements. This S is defined on general elements. So, for example, if one wanted to consider S evaluated on an inhomogeneous element 
with a sum, and of, a sum of a term in degree zero and a term in degree one, the action functional here would encode, um, for example, terms like omega alpha paired, say alpha one paired with alpha zero bracket alpha one, sorry, it should be a one. This is describing, this is how one includes the infinitesimal gauge symmetry action. So the inter infinitesimal gauge symmetry is represented by alpha zero um, on the physical field, which is represented here by alpha one. So we allow inputs into this S with an inhomogeneous element of E. So if, if, if alpha is non-homogeneous, I, I guess you could choose alpha, alpha not to be A and alpha one to be F, right? Isn't that correct? And that would co uh, cause uh, yeah. the linear derivative term. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's an example of the sort of term that would be permitted by this formalism. Yeah, I, I want to emphasize, I'm using the notation of D and the, um, the Lie brackets here. It might be making people think of chern simons theory. This is exactly the form of the action functional of chern simons theory. And that's the example I'm going to talk about on the next slide. But I want to emphasize this formalism is, is more general. It does allow for non-topological terms when one considers a general DG Lie algebra with a general differential. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Durham differential on Durham forms. This D could be any, um, any square zero differential. And this Lie bracket doesn't have to be encoded by the Lie bracket on a coefficient Lie algebra. This could be any Lie bracket on E. So we're going to talk about chern simons in a second, but this um, formalism is, is more general. Are there any questions? Any more questions at this point? Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, so mm -hmm. does S alpha have a degree as well, like in this? Um... Does, uh, the, sorry, the action does alpha? Uh, yes, yeah, so the action should be degree zero in total. So the this will only be non-zero if the total input to omega, so the sum of the two terms that one is inputting, has degree three. So the out, well, yeah, sorry, yeah, has degree, we want the, the output of omega, sorry, to be a top form on M, to be a density. So this will be non-trivial, for example, when if all the inputs, if, if we input an element of degree one, then we'll have a total element of degree one paired with an element of degree two. Um, but this is not the only possibility. So I, I maybe should have said, thank God I should have put here, I should have allowed here a, an omega, an alpha two. So this element here has total degree three. So pairing an element of an element of this form, when one inputs an inhomogeneous element alpha zero plus alpha one plus alpha two, will give a non-trivial will will potentially evaluate some non-zero um, when we input it into the action functional. But S overall is a functional degree zero because omega should output a density. We want the degree zero section of the bundle of densities in order to get a non-trivial integral. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we can inco incorporate higher than cubic interactions by generalizing this notion of a Lie algebra, to an L infinity algebra. Uh, so may I have a question, question please? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so what exactly do you mean by um, uh, the infinitesimal gauge symmetry action of alpha not on alpha one? So, this action functional is in it's encoding, in particular, the sort of the BRST structure in a gauge theory, the BRST action functional structure in a gauge theory. So this action, to put it another way, there's a geometric way of thinking about it. Um, this E, the data of E with its Lie brackets, is equivalent to the data of the tangent space at a point to the space of solutions to the equations of motion theory. So if I say, let's call it a curly M, by this I mean my space of solutions to the equations of motion, I'm encoding the tangent space at some, some classical solution X. 
So some point in M. So this is this is the tangent to solutions of the equations of motion. Um, and I really should say the tangent space shifted um, up by one by one degree in chromological degree. Um, if M is the space of solutions to the equations of motion in a gauge theory, I shouldn't think of it as a space in the classical sense, but maybe as a stack. It includes the data of um, symmetries of a classical solution. Now, there's in the language of um, algebraic geometry, derived algebraic geometry, one can make sense of the tangent space to something like a stack. But it won't generally be a vector space anymore. It'll be a cochain complex. So it'll have cohomology in degrees other than zero. And the cohomology in degree minus one, which becomes the cohomology in degree zero when we shift up by one, um, represents the, the stabilizers of the point X inside this um, space, where they're sort of infinitesimal um, gauge symmetries. So that's the sort of thing that I mean yeah, there's a geometric interpretation of this whole story in terms of the moduli space of solutions. And in a gauge theory, one has to include some sort of non-trivial, some stacky data when one studies this moduli space. Thank you. I don't know if that's... Okay. Let me give some examples there. A quick question before I move on. Yeah. Um, and so that alpha, for example, here you wrote alpha equals alpha zero plus alpha one. Is this a choice mm -hmm. or? Uh... So alpha is allowed to be any inhomogeneous element of E. So in general, if I chose an element of E, I could decompose it into a sum of its homogeneous components in each degree in which E is supported. So it's, it's, it's not a choice. A general element of curly E can be written as a sum of terms in each um, in each cohomological degree. So I mean, really in general, so for example, if E was supported in degrees zero, one, two, and three, then a general way of writing, a general element alpha could be written as a sum, alpha zero plus alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three. Okay. These are the components in each degree. And, and uh, I suppose if we would define the quantum theory, you would want to, like roughly integrate over the space of alpha, like all possible alpha. Um, you, roughly, I mean, you, if you're thinking about the, in the path integral, one wants to interpret the path integral as an integral over the space of all alphas in in all degrees. I'm going to think about the quantum the quantization in terms of the deformation quantization of functionals on this space. Okay, so now if I look at this page of definitions. Um, which part is the the one I, I should input? Looks like everything is like. Sorry, which part is? Which like if I want to define a, a, phys, a, a physical a theory, right? Which part mm -hmm. should I input? Uh, is well, my what, input? So your input. If you're given um, an action functional, then what one should do is write out the, we're doing perturbative field theory here. So what we should do is choose a classical solution and compute the Taylor expansion of your action functional around that classical solution. One will use the quadratic term in the Taylor expansion to generate the differential on your complex of fields. And one will use the cubic term in that interaction, in that in the Taylor expansion, to generate the Lie bracket on the space of fields. And if there are higher order terms, one needs this generalization of the algebra, the infinity algebra. I so there is, an, there is an algorithm that involves starting with your DRST fields, adding on a shifted copy of its dual to generate E, and then using the Taylor terms in the action functional to generate the DG Lee structure on E. There's an algorithm for taking a space of fields and an action functional and generating an instance of this definition. Sure. Cool. Okay. okay, so let's do, a, let's talk about a couple of examples. And I've also already talked about these a little bit. The first example is Chern Simon's theory. The um, definition I gave for those that are familiar with Chern Simon's theory should have looked very suggestive. This is almost exactly the form of the Chern Simon action functional. 
So my space time now is going to be a compact oriented three manifold. And I'm going to choose a semi-simple Lie algebra G as part of, I'm going to, this is the data that I'm going to use to define my space of fields E. So the fields, the space of fields that I will take is given by the Durham forms on M tensored with the Lie algebra G. So this is my example of an example of an E. This has a DG Lie structure, and let's spell out what it is. So the DG Lie structure here is given by, so my differential is just the Durham differential on M. And my Lie bracket of two, um, let's say I had a differential form tensor, an element of the Lie algebra paired with a, another element of the same. I'll bracket these together by wedging the form component and taking the Lie brackets of the G components. So that's how I make this into a DG Lie algebra. Okay. Finally, this has a symplectic pairing, and the recipe for the symplectic pairing is I take the, again, I'm going to wedge together the form components, but I'm now I'm going to use an invariant pairing on the um, Lie algebra component. So I could think of this angle bracket. So this represents so the killing form on G. So this is now no longer has any Lie algebra dependence. This is now a differential form. And it's a density precisely when the sum of the degree of alpha and the degree of beta is three. Because I want to get a total, a density is a equivalent to a three form on M. Okay. So, suppose alpha is a degree one element. So that is an element of and a one form on M with values in G. So this is what one would think of as a field in um, a physical field in Chern Simons theory. Okay, it's a it's it's a, um, we're working perturbatively, so it's a, a, a perturbation of a connection on a principal G bundle. On the trivial bundle, in fact. So if we apply the recipe above, then we extract the churn simons action functional. For alpha one form, this is exactly the familiar to some people form of the churn simons action functional. We have a term that looks like alpha wedge d alpha, and a term that looks like alpha wedge alpha paired with alpha. But as I mentioned before, we can input inhomogeneous elements as well. Um, and this will encode the infinitesimal action of omega zero m on omega one m by um, by the Lie bracket. So that's the infinitesimal action uh, infinitesimal action of gauge symmetries on a gauge field. Okay. Any questions before I move on? Okay. Let me give a more general family of examples, and this is what I promised in the beginning of the talk. We're going to talk about what's called topological AKSD theory. And it's going to be a generalization of this Chern Simons example. So, not when well, first thing I'm going to generalize, I'm no longer going to restrict the three manifolds. I'm going to allow any oriented n manifolds for any dimension. So, these AKSD theories are defined in any dimension. I'm going to replace my G. So, previously G was a semi simple Lie algebra. I'm going to replace G by any DG Lie algebra, L, with the structure of a pairing, a non-degenerate invariant pairing of degree 3 minus N. So the example we had before, it, if I let L equal G, this has a pairing of degree 0. So this makes sense when N is equal to 3. But to give another an example that makes sense so more generally, I could take L to be a, given by a copy of G plus a copy of G dual with a shift. So this means I shift in degree by, I, I shift um, down by N minus three. So 
the semi-direct product here means that my Lie bracket is given by, I have a bracket on, on G, and I also have a term given by the coadjoint action of G on G star. This is an additional term in my Lie bracket. Okay, and this has a pairing given by pairing together the two summands. Um, just using the evaluation pairing on a... Sorry, segment. could you just remind me what a coadjoint action is? Oh, I yes. So um, for any Lie algebra, the adjoint action is given by the action of G on itself by the Lie bracket. So this is a representation of G. The coadjoint action is the linear dual representation on the linear dual space. So this is just the dual to the action of G on itself by, by Lie bracket. An example would be? An example would be, I mean, the example you could keep in mind is that G equals SLN. Um, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say. G SLN acts on itself. Um, so if I let V also equal SLN, then there's, and I could take X and I could have it act on some V by the rule, by the Lie bracket. This defines uh, a representation of G. And so this is the adjoint representation. Its dual is the um, linear dual of this linear dual of this representation. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So, here's my definition. Uh, this is a class of examples. And what is a bracket on this L? How to define I, the bracket? Sorry. Yes, yes. So this is what I was saying over here. Um, the brackets consist of two terms. There's a bracket, I can bracket together two elements of G. Um, just using the Lie algebra on G. And I can also bracket an element of G with an element of G dual via the coadjoint action. And there's no bracket between two elements of G star. Um, the bracket of any two elements in G star is zero. Thank you. So a topological AKSD theory on M with targets, I'm going to use this term with target BL. This is you can. This is just a terminology. This is I'm thinking of it as modeling maps from M into the classifying space of L. But you don't need to worry about that term if that's not familiar with you for you. But the definition, what it is, you take the. This is our E. This is our oops, E. It's the Durham forms on M with coefficients in L. And the pairing is induced by the pairing on L and the wedge pairing of differential forms. So Chern Simons is an example where M is a three manifold and L is just a Lie algebra with its degree zero pairing. The example that I just gave is the, theory, the associated theory is known as BS theory. And the reason is, if we denote a generic field as A comma B, so this is G valued, and this is the G dual shifted valued piece, the action functional, when one extracts it using the formula I described earlier, looks like B wedge FA. Okay, so B wedge DA plus B wedge a bracket A. So this is why it's called BS theory. And this makes sense on any oriented N manifold for any N. Is there a question? No. So I, I could point to there are a lot of ex a, a, a source of examples of topological AKSC theories is studying twists of supersymmetric field theories, like twists of supersymmetric yang mills theories, for example. Um, an example that I like to think about is given by this BF theory, where, so in dimension four, 
So if n equals four, I can study. Oh, yeah. And what is f f a? It is curvature. What is it? F a. Perfect. I mean, it's a half t a plus one six mm. a which I. That's what I mean. Thank you. So an example BF theory with values in um, well with say it's like this. I could let L be given by G adjoin an element epsilon acting on G dual adjoin the same epsilon with a shift um, by one. So where epsilon is a parameter of degree one, so it's a formal parameter. The associated BF theory one can prove is equivalent to a topological twist of 4D n equals four theory. This was a theory first studied by Kapustin and Witten. So these sorts of examples show up when one studies twisted supersymmetric gauge theory. Okay. Any more questions at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah happy question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, so the this L, can you think of it as a two-term L infinity algebra? Um, absolutely. It's well, it's an L infinity algebra. It's it's in fact it's a it's a strictly algebra. Um, but one could make sense of this. One could allow G to be an any L infinity algebra and apply the same structure. So. It's an infinity algebra, but but it's a, it's a it's a strict G the algebra. It doesn't have any higher brackets. But one could uh, generalize instead of replace G by an infinity algebra and apply the same recipe. And earlier you you showed the um, the Chern Simons form for the classical BV theory. In that case, uh -huh. it seems that you have uh, a Chern Simons form. But just say you consider. Um, the, including the structure of an L, L infinity algebra. So where do the higher brackets come in? Well, the higher brackets come in. So one can generalize this definition to allow for the coefficient. If I go back to my, let's see, let's go back here. The action functional associated to this theory has only quadratic and cubic terms, no higher order terms. If one replaced this DG structure by an L infinity structure, the one included say for higher brackets, then one would include additional terms. For example, if one had a, a cubic term, one could include an additional term that looked like, I could pair alpha with one over 24, um, L3, alpha tensor three. Now this would be a quartic term associated to the cubic um, higher brackets on E if I have this additional structure. So if one wanted to do Yang Mills theory in this formalism, one would need to describe an L infinity algebra structure on the complex that I wrote um, on this complex, an L infinity structure that included both quadratic and cubic brackets. Mm -hmm. so one could write down formulas for this. Just uh, one more question. Uh, you mentioned the ge the geometric Langlands twist, I think, when you were talking about Kapustin and Witten's work, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you're mentioning uh, the relation of the BF theory. So, do you mean in the sense of uh, you have you can put the twisted theory in the form of Q exact term plus uh, the BF action? That's right, exactly. Um, I wrote a paper with. Um, Pavel Safranov and Brian Williams, where we computed uh, models for all twists of super Yang mill series in all dimensions. Um, where and, and the way we think about it is we write out the twisted BB theory. Um, so it includes the Q exact terms. And one writes a quasi isomorphic model for each example that is a, a sort of a small and un understandable model. And many of these examples are BF theories, these models for the twisted theories. So it, like you're saying, yes, I, I, I'm saying that the um, theory is quasi-isomorphic. The twisted theory is quasi-isomorphic to a BF theory. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So is the L, L infinity algebra an infinite dimensional algebra? Not, no, not necessarily. Um, it just means it's a, it's a homotopy generalization of a Lie algebra that includes brackets of order greater than two. 
So it needn't necessarily be infinite dimensional, though many natural examples are. So what do you mean by homotopy generalization of a Lie algebra exactly? Well, so here's the idea. Suppose one tried to write down a Lie bracket, but one found it didn't satisfy the Jacobi identity on the nose. Instead, it satisfied the Jacobi identity up to some error term. What one could try to do is introduce a cubic bracket um, that encoded the error in satisfying of the quadratic bracket in satisfying the um, Jacobi identity. And one could write down higher, like analogs of the Jacobi identity that incorporated these higher brackets in addition to the quadratic bracket. Um, and there's a, we can, one could go higher. What, what, has, what has that got to do with homotopy? Sorry? I'm sorry. What has that got yet. to do with homotopy? Well, one could think of the cubic bracket as including, one could think of a, um, the quadratic bracket is not satisfying the, um, I, I, I mean, there's a, there's a story in homotopical algebra where the operad that encodes Lie algebras has a resolution, has a homotopic, has a homotopy replacement um, whose algebras are exactly these. Infinity algebras. But I think, given that I have a limited amount of time left, I, I would like to say maybe something about um, quantization before I finish, if that's okay. So, yeah, yeah. So let me say something about quantization. Um, and I'm going to be fairly brief. I'm not going to give details on how quantization works for reasons of time. But one can include the data of the quantization of the classical field theory in this language. So I'm just going to make a few comments on how this goes. So there's essentially a two-step process when quantizing these theories. The first step, and this is in following Wilson's um, renormalization group um, paradigm, one should construct a family of effective field theories that depends on a regularization scale which I'll denote capital lambda, which are related in a, in a natural way by the renormalization group flow. So there's a way of describing how the theory at scale um, lambda one should be related to the theory at scale lambda two. A construction of a family of effective field theories that satisfies this condition is called a pre-quantization. So it's a way of taking your um, classical theory and computing a family of effective theories at all scales. So these top, this, so this is a procedure that one can pursue in general, but there's a particularly nice model for these pre-quantizations for these topological AKFC theories. This was developed by Konsevich and by Axel and Singer for the example of chern simons theory in particular, um, where the pre-quantizations are constructed using certain intervals over configuration spaces. Um, and it's a nice model that, in general, there are counter terms one needs to construct when building these effective field theories, and there are, there are no counter terms to these theories, these topological AKC theories. There is, however, a potential obstruction, a potential problem with these pre quantizations. One would like to write down a deformation quantization of the algebra of classical observables. Classical observables are essentially functional on the classical solutions to the equations of motion. This algebra of functionals has a Poisson bracket, and one can try to deformation quantize that algebra. When one tries to do this, there's a potential problem. The DG algebra that one constructs, the purported differential may fail to square to zero. So the, obstruct, the failure to, for this differential to square to zero is known as the anomaly for this quantization. So a true quantization should be a pre-quantization in which the anomaly vanishes. And often the, um, the, the game in this formalism is to try to compute the spaces where these anomalies live, construct the anomalies using um, Diamond diagrammatic calculations as elements of certain sort of cohomology groups and verify under what circumstances these anomalies vanish. 
what happens if we want to go to, to curved spacetimes, curved manifolds? So this is my motivating question. Suppose I've constructed already a quantization of a topological AKSE theory on flat space on Rn. So I've constructed a pre-quantization and I've proved that the anomaly for this pre-quantization is zero. The most facing question is, when is it possible to extend this to a quantization on more general oriented n manifolds, not just Rn? Well, this is the question that um, my work has been addressing. And we address this using ideas coming from topology, specifically the theory of factorization homology. So let me explain that idea that we're going to use. The idea we bring in from topology is, in order to extend our quantization to a general oriented n-manifold, what we need is for our theory on Rn, so our quantum theory, to admit a certain kind of action of rotations. So the group SON acts on Rn by rotations, and I would like to be able to lift that rotation action to the quantum theory itself, or to the algebra of quantum observables. But I want a particularly nice sort of action, what I've called here a topological action, not just any action of SON. So what does this mean? What do I mean by, what kind of action do I want? And how is it going to help me? So let me explain in the example of topological AKSC theory. So for a topological AKSC theory, there's, an act, there's always an action of isometries on the theory. This is at the classical level. And it's given by the lead derivative. So if I have here a field alpha, this lives in my E, I can act by, so V is a sort of a vector field generating an isometry. Generating an isometry. I can act by the lead derivative with respect to V. This is the, we could we could realize this as a um, via a Hamiltonian. The sort of Hamiltonian associated to this symmetry is given by a term of the form where I pair alpha with the lead derivative of alpha. So this is my Hamiltonian for the isometry. Even better, at least at the classical level, this action can be homotopically trivialized. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is now an, um, a degree minus one symmetry associated to the same V where I apply the interior product um, um, with V on alpha. So this lowers the degree by one. And it has the property that when I apply D, my differential in my, so D was the differential on my E, my complex of fields, the Durham derivative, I get back the original um, action of isometries. This is via Cartan's formula, relating the um, lead derivative with the, um, the commutator of the interior products and the exterior derivative. So let me comment, the way I could think about this is I have an action, not just of isometries, but of, is a way of thinking about it in, homo in homological algebra, a DG Lie algebra, which I'll call iso Duram, where I have isometries in degree minus one, plus isometries in degree zero, and a differential, which is an isomorphism. So this Lie algebra is um, contractible. So I, and an action of this Lie algebra means I have an action of iso n and a homotopy between that contraction, between that action and zero. That's exactly what's been given, the exact sort of data I have on the um, classical fields or the classical observables by this procedure. 
So here's the relevant results. It's possible to extend this quantization, extend the quantization of the theory on Rn to oriented n manifolds, to any oriented n manifolds, precisely when we can lift this symmetry, so this iso n Duram action, to the quantum level. So we can quantize this symmetry. So this is a result that I proved with Pavel Safranov a few years ago. Um, and he uses this, this language in the homotopy theory of um, factorization homology. We construct a certain structure on the algebra of observables that allows us to globalize the quantum observables from Rn to an oriented n-manifold. So the question becomes, suppose we have a topological AKSC theory, and we have an action of um, isometries by the lead derivative, which I can quantize. The question becomes, can I quantize this homotopy trivialization? And if I can, that gives me a procedure that allows me to extend my quantization on Rn to a more general a quantization on a general oriented N manifold. So the question is, can we quantize this classical symmetry? Okay, so the theorem that we proved with Owen addresses this question. So my input data is a topological AKSC theory on Rn with targets DG Lie algebra L. So that means, remember that EL is the Duran forms on Rn tensored with L. That's my fields. So when I say the framing anomaly, what I mean here is the obstruction to quantizing the trivialization of the SON action. So this is the this is equivalently the obstruction to globalizing my quantization. So the the anomaly. Why? What is the relationship between the two? Why? Why should quantizing the real? Well, this real is this. Yeah, this is the result that I proved. So this is this is this result with Safranov. We proved that if you can quantize this trivialization, then the observables they have a structure of what's called a framed EN algebra, um, and the the. Formalism in topology of factorization homology allows one to compute the globalization of a framed DN algebra on any oriented N manifold. Without this, in general, if one didn't have this um, trivial SON action, one could only globalize to a framed, a framed N manifold using this procedure. But if you have the quantization of this homotopy trivialized SON action, one can compute the factorization homology on any oriented manifold. And as I said, that's, that's a theorem with um, Safranov. Okay. So what we proved with Gwilym, we described the, uh, gave a, a finite dimensional model for the cohomology group in which this anomaly lives. Um, which allows one to, for in many examples, show directly that the anomaly must vanish by computing this, the algebra cohomology. So where the framing anomaly lives, we have two factors. We have a term that looks like the cohomology of SON. So this has generators in degrees three mod four. Okay. And a factor that looks like the cohomology of my target. Okay, 
Um, and the condition I have, I have only classes associated to degrees greater than zero, an SON factor. And the total degree where the associated to the Fermi anomaly is, is degree N. So I'm looking for classes in this tensor product of total degree N. And the Fermi anomaly is represented by such a class. We can actually ask something a bit stronger. If we want the homotopy trivialization to itself be Hamiltonian at the quantum level, um, so if we want a, Hamil a quantum Hamiltonian that represents this homotopy trivialized action, one only has to modify the statement a little bit. What one has to do is remove this little reduce. So this means the reduced cohomology. If one removes this reduced condition, then one is asking for the um, obstruction to a Hamiltonian, the existence of a Hamiltonian action of this thing, SON to arm. So maybe I'll conclude by giving a few examples. And the sorts of examples we talked about um, earlier on. Let's start with the example of BF theory. So there L is given by G acting on G star with a shift. And in fact, only the only the G factor contributes. This is one can see by studying the relevant Simon diagrams, only the fields living in G factor um, appear in the Simon diagrams of the anomaly. So one is now considering relatively familiar Lie algebra cohomology groups. So suppose G is simple. So in that case, we have a very um, sort of classical understanding of exactly what these Lie algebra cohomologies look like. So for example, if N is odd, then this, then this relevant cohomology group vanishes. These, each of these are only supported in odd degrees, and so the total degree is always even. So if I want to get an odd degree, then the, relevant, the odd cohomology on the right-hand side is always zero. So there's no framing anomaly for BF theory in odd dimensions. And in fact, if G is SO or SP, type B or type C, or type D, um, this Lie algebra is supported, this Lie algebra cohomology is supported in degrees three mod four. So it vanishes unnecessarily except for dimension two mod four. For Chern Simons theory, there's an obstruction not to a strict SO3 action, but to an inner, a, a Hamiltonian SO3 action. And it's given by the generator of H3 of SO3. It's associated to a certain Simon diagram with two legs, where the legs are labeled by this SO3. Final example in Kapustin Witten theory that I mentioned, this twist looks like a BF theory where the Lie algebra is G adjoin an odd parameter, parameter of degree one. So in previous work, in work last year with William and Williams, we showed that the framing anomaly vanishes for this theory. The relevant cohomology is, is not zero. Again, we had a, a vanishing condition for odd degree. We're here we're in dimension four, the even dimension. But we proved that the framing anomaly nevertheless still vanishes. What in fact one finds, there's going to be a term associated to each of the two summands. This looks like G plus G epsilon. There's a term associated to each of the two summons, and those terms are equal but with um, signs that can't um, negative. One, one is minus the other, um, and so the total anomaly vanishes. Okay, I think I am out of time, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. So let's th uh, all thank uh, Chris again for a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, so Chris, I, I had a question. So, uh, so are, are there examples of theories of this AKZ type where the framing anomaly sort of can't be fixed? Uh, basically, you don't get a TQFT after quantizing or something like that? Because in John Simons, although it's non-zero, there's a way to sort of dress it up and you do get an honest TQFT at the end, right? Yes, I, I, I mean, 
this is what I was getting at with this Hamiltonian condition. And Chen Simons, and I, I'd love to understand how this connects to the, the more familiar story for Chen Simons. The Chen Simons theory, there is no obstruction to quantizing the SO3 Durham action. So you can always play oh, this theory. So you okay. can always um, compute quantum Chen Simons on a curved three manifold. But there, there is this interesting condition that the action is not Hamiltonian, it's not inner. So there's no quantum Hamiltonian that represents the trivialization. Um, and I'd love to understand how this condition relates to the conditions that Konsevich, for example, has written about, where one needs to specify a framing in order to compute the propagator in Chern Simon's theory. Yeah. I, I, so, so that that's something interesting that happens in that example, the next sort of thing that you're asking about. So okay. there is an obstruction, uh, and, and it's it's generated, as I said, the obstruction for this inner action is generated by a, a Simon diagram with two, a wheel with two legs, where each of these mm -hmm. legs is labeled by essentially SO3 with a shift by one. The one interpretation, one potential interpretation for this is one studying the coupling of chern simons theory to gravity. Um, and one could think of this as an anomaly associated to the ghost for the spin connection in 3D gravity. That's the, uh, the if one considered the local Lie algebra that represents SO3 with a shift by one, that's exactly where the ghost for the spin connection um, in gravity, 3D gravity, in the first order formalism would live. So this seems like it's describing an anomaly for this associated with, to this coupling. Um, but that's not, I mean, that's something I'd love to pursue further, it's sort of suggestive, but I don't know the exact best interpretation. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question or? Yeah, yeah, uh, I think so. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that that the example of a Cax Moody algebra, for instance, is a is an example of a homotopy generalization of a Lie algebra? Um, I don't think I would. I think I would say, but there are there are analogs like this. There are higher analogs of Cax Moody algebras where one is forming a central extension associated not to a one co-cycle, but to a co-cycle of higher degree. Um, yeah, so, I mean, for, for yeah, Katz Moody, so, yeah. the co-cycle is of degree one. So for higher... Exactly. So, yeah. so for Katz Moody, the co-cycle is degree one. So the central extension is still a Lie algebra, not a homotopy Lie algebra. But if you're, there's analogs of Katz Moody Lie algebra um, that have been, uh, that are associated to conformal field theories and complex dimension greater than one where one forms a higher central extension, so a central extension associated to a co-cycle of degree greater than one. So these higher centrally extended Lie algebras are no longer strict Lie algebras, they're some kind of L-infinity algebra. Um, and that would be an example of some a homotopical version of the Lie algebra, these higher analogs. So I was just wondering, since you're just uh, tensoring the Lie algebra along with the base manifold, uh, mm -hmm. So you're, you're sort of considering the algebra to be the algebra of the entire uh, sort of tensor, tensored product. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, being, I'm, I'm being a bit vague, but uh, like if, if your manifold was just a cocycle one manifold, then you would have had the Cax Moody algebra, right? Now, instead of the cocycle one manifold, you are you are considering a general arbitrary n-dimensional manifold. So, uh -huh. instead of the Cax Moody algebra, you would have a generalization to a more. I mean, well, yeah, I, well, I, except I haven't quite formed. I haven't been forming a central ex, uh, any kind of extension here. I'm just taking strictly the, the tensor products between my Durham forms. The Cax Moody example, maybe I would think of. Dolbo forms instead of Durham forms. If I studied Dol the Dol 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 Dolbo complex on a complex disk or on C with coefficients in G, um, this represents a version of um, a beta gamma system. Again, this theory has only cubic interactions and, and no higher terms. It has these central extensions that are associated to um, um, 
the, the places where where quantizations of the G symmetry should live, where net occurrence of the G symmetry should live in this kind of theory. But in the in the um, the spaces of fields that I was considering, I was I was just forming the the tensor product. I wasn't then taking an additional step where I construct some kind of central extension of the results. So I really am just studying theories, either, either theories where the the BV complex is just a CG Lie algebra and not an infinity algebra, or equivalently theories where the interaction is purely cubic and doesn't contain any higher order term. But as I mentioned, there are many examples with high order term interactions, especially especially non-topological theories. And the Angle theory would be an example where the BV complex would be a genuine L-infinity algebra, where there was not just a quadratic bracket, but also a cubic bracket. OK. Uh, but I, I have a question. Uh, so there are instances of um, different Lagrangians giving rise to the same equations of motion in, in general. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like, uh, if a situation like that arises um, in the context of topological AKSZ algebras and uh, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, topological AKSZ theories, and um, if it does, like, uh, does this result about this uh, anomaly? I mean, I mean, does the anomaly really depend on particular Lagrangian uh, you choose? Yeah. The the no, it doesn't. And the one advantage of the BV formalism is that it gives a nice way of um, Describing the condition you're talking about, about having in equivalent, having different Lagrangians that describe the same theories, because one has the language of a quasi isomorphism as a cochain complex. If we realize the BV, the, the classical field theory using the language of a cochain complex, one can easily say what it means for two theories, two Lagrangian theories to be equivalent. We're just asking for those complexes to be quasi isomorphic, compatibly with the um, additional structure, the Lee bracket. Um, and this is, in fact, this is exactly what we do in this paper with um, Safanov and Williams, where we describe twisted supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. We start with the supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, consider it's a BV complex. We turn on the twist, so we deform this complex associated to um, a deformation associated to a, um, a square zero supersymmetry. The complex is generally very large. It includes all the same fields that the original supersymmetry, supersymmetric theory has, but it now has these additional terms in the action functional that are Q-exact. Um, and we say we can explicitly construct a quasi-isomorphic model that is usually defined, it's often these sorts of BF theory type models, so defined in terms of the Durham complex, or maybe a, a less, not a fully topological version, a version that using the Dolbo complex. And so it's exactly that. It's describing two different Lagrangian, giving two different equivalent Lagrangian descriptions of the same theory. Now, all this story about anomalies, this takes place in the homological algebra context. The anomaly is a class in, it's represented by a co-cycle in a certain, um, in, in a certain cochain complex. If one chooses in equivalent descriptions of the same theory, the cochain complexes where the anomalies live will themselves be quasi isomorphic. And so the anomaly, we can transfer that class back and forth along the, the quasi isomorphism. The condition that that co cycle is a co boundary is invariant under that transformation. So it doesn't depend on the model we chose. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. That, that really helped. I have a question. Um... So uh, back to the uh, the story of geometric Langlands, you mentioned the BF uh, formalism, and um, it mm -hmm. seems that it is, it's it's um, the the fields B and F are valued in some uh, graded Lie algebra. So I'm trying to understand uh, what what kind of uh, interpretation the B the fields B and F have in terms of the fields of the geometric Langlands twisted uh, Fourier theory, because. I'm more familiar with the topolo topological term being of the form like uh, having a parameter psi, uh, f h f, or say it's a, Chan a 3D Chan Simons term if the theory has a boundary, and where mm -hmm. you have a complex combination of the gauge field and the scalar field, for example, or what, it's pre what was the scalar field before twisting? But what, what is exactly B here? A, okay, it's a good question, and I don't know exactly. Uh, this might be like we were just talking about the condition where one has quasi-isomorphic models for the same theory. So certainly the kind of thing one can do is to start with 
a theory and the untwisted theory is and ask what its image is in this model for the twisted theory. The way I like to think about geometric Langlands, in general, one has a family, um, I'll, I'll write it like this. One has a family of cochain complexes with the following differential. I can take, um, and so sorry, let me join a parameter here. This is the, this is the model for the geometric Langlands family. I have the differential del bar, and I'll add on a pair of terms to look like this that say nu del plus nu d by d epsilon. So this is a, a two parameter family. So here mu nu, I can think of, maybe I'll even think of it as, think of these as homogeneous coordinates for a point in CP1. It's a, it's a, if I think about the, this up to rescaling, it's a one parameter projective family of theories, of topological theories. Um, the example I was talking about before was the case where mu nu equals one zero. So this is the Capuchin written B twist, and it's given by an example of a, a BF theory, one of these topological AKC theories. Oh. So we, you can try to take this model and understand where the component fields came from, from the point of view of the original untwisted. The Yang Mills theory, and I, I, I can't certainly can't do it on the on the fly. Um, there's we so we we described this model in this paper with um, Safranov and Williams, where we we explained how twists of super Yang Mills theory arise from this point of view. But it's somewhat indirect. So you start with the ten z n equals one theory, a super Yang Mills theory, compute it. It has a holomorphic twist which you can then dimensionally reduce to 4D, and then you can ask for the further twist. Yeah. So translating between this and the, the model in terms of the supersymmetric theory with the, the differential deformed by the appropriate supercharge, it's theoretically possible, they're quasi-isomorphic, and one could try to unpack and write down a co-chain homotopy between these complexes. But I, 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 don't, I don't think I can, I don't think I can do it um, in any kind of real time. Okay, okay. Well, thanks, that's really helpful, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah. when, you want, uh, when you said you want to uh, quantize the, the trivialization of S1 action, mm -hmm. uh, uh, can I think of that as you, like, you want to, uh, uh, require the, this action, this SON action, to somehow commute with the differential in the in the DG algebra, um, or is even uh, that's not quite the how exact. I think about it. No, that's not quite how I would think about it. I would think about it as one could think about this using a, a background field perspective. One could think about coupling the original theory, classical field theory. The background fields valued in the Lie algebra when trying to act. So in that case, in, in our case, we're sort of coupling to to the Lie algebra, say S O N to Ram. As I mentioned, this looks like S O N shifted by one, mapping to S O N in degree zero by an isomorphism. So one can include background fields valued in this Lie algebra and write down essentially an equivariant. Um, action functional, classical action functional, that includes these background fields. So that's going to encode the, um, the, the, the symmetry. Now, what one wants to do is to quantize that theory with background fields. So one wants to construct a theory with background fields um, that quantizes this, the quantum theory that quantizes this theory with background fields. And, and um, by, uh, in, by, so you, by, um, by, by quantizing this, you actually means like constructing a family of like factor field theory liberal by L. Exactly. So we can certainly okay. construct pre-quantization, the family of effective field theories that includes these background fields. But then one wants to ask, does this um, pre-quantization, um, does it have a quantum anomaly? So what one wants to, one wants to check that this pre-quantization solves the quantum master equation. 
and that's what it means for the anomaly to vanish. And in general, there's an obstruction. And what we prove is that obstruction lives in uh, the cohomology group that I described. Yeah. So we're going to try to pre-quantize the theory with background field, that sort of the equivariant theory, and then try and study that pre-quantization and ask whether it's anomalous. But in certain cases, I, I can't, for example, if mm, a theory has some um, global symmetry, uh, it does make sense to think of that to commute with a differential. Uh, am I wrong? Or... Let's see. If I have some action and it commute with uh, Q, uh, that yeah. differential, then I would want to call that uh, a symmetry. Well, this... yes. So, okay, but then when we quantize, we need to ask how we need to extend that symmetry to the quantum theory. So we'll, right. we'll have quantum corrections to the action functional that are proportional to H bar. So right. one wants to say how the symmetry acts on those new terms, those quantum corrections. And one wants to extend this symmetry to it to still be um, uh, an action of the, um, on the cochain complex, so it should commute with the quantum differential. So if okay. we have to commute with the original classical differential, but then we'll have to extend this to an action on the on the quantization, and that extension should have the property that it compute, commutes with the quantum BV differential. I so see. there's extra data as well as conditions. It's not just a condition on the classical field that we need to describe additional wow. data. Quantize it. Another thing I'm confused about is um, it, it, you want this theory to be topological, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. don't you want this SO action to be trivial in some way? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The SON action is homotopically trivial. So one has an SON action, and one wants the data of a homotopy trivialization of that SON action. That's the, and that's exactly what we're trying to construct. I see. OK, cool. The same as when, like, the, the condition of the quantum level being trivial is essentially equivalent to the translation action being homotopically trivialized. It's saying, in the language that's in the more physical language, it's saying that the stress energy tensor is uh, Q exact, like, the stress energy tensor is trivialized. And we're yeah, asking, yeah. For, asking for the, the, the infinitesimal the symmetry the, um, of rotations to be homotopically trivialized at the quantum level. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any hands raised. So maybe uh, I'll ask one more. This is more about the uh, uh, PV formalism itself. So, so it, if you have a topological theory that you're describing uh, in this formalism, yeah. uh, so is it kind of obvious in this formalism that under RG flow, let's say it's not a conformity, so that there is some non-trivial RG flow. Uh, under RG flow, this TQFT is somehow, quote unquote, remains the same. Uh, I'll tell you the kind of example I have in mind. Like if you have something like Donaldson with twist of n equals to two, uh, this is sort of true, but highly non-obvious. Uh, it's, it's something you sort of check uh, well, okay, so, so maybe you have some expectation that it should be the same, but uh, to check that the Donaldson within TQFT uh, gives the same answers or it, it's computing the same kinds of things as the cyborg within thing, uh, it's it's highly non trivial. If you do it for a non conformal n equal to two theory, like a pure SU2 or something like that. Uh, but I, I'm wondering uh, if thinking about this theory and its RG flow in this topological BV formalism, uh, does it give any insight? I think, I think probably for these, for example, these BF theories, these AKSD type theories, that it should be, mm -hmm. it should be fairly easy to see that the renormalization group flow is, that that is, is not doing anything very interesting. Okay. So I guess a lot of the work maybe is if one, taking a theory that one wants to understand and asking and showing that it's equivalent to a theory of this type. Now, the examples you were talking about are, are like, what I think of as A-type theories, like the actual BV complex is contractible and things like Donaldson theory. 
Um, there, there's interesting things happening. In order to see interesting phenomena, one has to do something more sophisticated. Either think about these theories as um, deformations of something non-contractable, like a holomorphic theory, or perhaps think about the theories in families over the moduli space of vacua, over, over some non-trivial parameter space. Like, you know, like a, 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 a contractible, something like the Durham complex, the cohomology of the Durham complex of Rn is not anything very interesting, but the Durham complex of a manifold as a sheaf over that manifold has interesting global cohomology. So those examples, the sort of Donaldson theory type examples would require understanding something maybe more sophisticated than what I'm talking about here, some kind of additional global structure. And I don't quite know, yeah, I don't know exactly how I would formulate your question about asking about the behavior of these things under RG flow while including that, ex like I, it was something, it would be something I'd have to think about. I don't have anything intelligent to say right now, I think. It's just a, a po point I want to make that the formalism as I've described it, these topological AKC theories, is sort of not sufficient to answer interesting questions about theories like Donaldson theory. One needs to include some extra structure if one wants to really, if one wants to study those sorts of theories, Donaldson or cyber theory. I see. Yeah. You know, or, or do something non-perturbative, right? The, the Durham, yeah. the Durham yeah. of a manifold is, is interesting, but the Durham complex of a vector space is not interesting. Yeah, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording. Uh, people can.